September 30th, 2020. For chapter 17 of the Gospel of Matthew. What is that? It is going away. Okay. Ba -da -ba -da -ba. All right. Hello, somebody's on here. Can't see who yet, but hello, how are you? Glad you can join us for Bible study. Let's see here. Chapter 17 today. Why am I not seeing this again? That's so weird. And we look very yellow tonight. At least on my phone, we look yellow. All right. This is odd. Regina, yay, welcome. Okay, now there it is. Welcome, welcome. Okay, let me go back here. We're starting on chapter 17 tonight. So, Ugh. come on. My fingers are. Okay. That just go. It's so weird. I just had it and now it's gone. Ugh. I am not. Oh. Sorry guys, I'm I have a love hate relationship with all technology, but especially Facebook. Okay. And now we're on here. Mm -hmm. But I can't seem to see what I was just looking at a moment ago. Well, that's appropriate. I'll just say that. Keep calm and pray for our priests. <laughs> Scrolling through, trying to find myself. Hey, Carmen. Your mom says hello from Oklahoma. Hi, mom. All right. Well, keep grieving. Let's see if I can go back through this way and find it. There we go. Oh, Scrolling through. Uh, uh, trying to find myself. Hey, Carmen! <laughs> Sorry. I, forgot. I had unmuted it because I was watching a... Uh... Watching a Theology of the Body Fulfilled session. Because there was a... You could watch the first session for free, and it ends tonight, so I thought I would quickly watch it. Okay. Just post. Just post. Okay. That's going. There we go. Okay. I think we are all together. Those of us who are going to make it this evening, probably, since it's... 8.04, your mom's here, so we have a quorum. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to open us in prayer? Would you like Father, me to? Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we, as always, we thank you for this day. Yes, Lord. For keeping us in your good graces and for protecting us and um, for helping us to do the best that we can with the gifts that you've given us. Open our hearts this evening, Father, um, to see the meaning of your son's life, finishing the transfiguration, um, and to be able to apply it to our own life and to, to welcome Jesus and ask him to transfigure our lives. We yes. ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. 
Uh, if you remember last time, we had Peter's Confession, uh, and then we had a prediction of the Passion, and that's kind of the key to the Transfiguration, I think. Um, back in chapter 16, verse 21, Jesus said from that, but it says that from that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And if you remember then, Peter takes him aside and Jesus rebukes him. But Jesus tells his disciples that if they're going to come after him, they must deny themselves and take up their cross. And that's how they will follow him. So this is where we've left the disciples and Jesus off. Okay, chapter 17 begins. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain apart. This is the inner circle, right? Mm -hmm. um, the high mountain apart is, according to 4th century tradition, a Mount Tabor, probably. It's a few miles to the east, southeast of Nazareth, so it's not very far from Nazareth. Uh, and it's uh, about two or three days uh, journey from Caesarea Philippi. So it's after about six days, so they've, they've taken them two or three days to get down there. Because um, that's where uh, Jesus had given his, first, his passion prediction was... At Caesarea Philippi, if you remember, in front of that great rock face, right? Okay. And and Mount Tabor is also called uh, Horeb, right? Uh, those are two different mountains, I think. I um, think maybe I'm wrong. According to this, well, I have it down as Tabor. Maybe it is Horeb. Uh, maybe no, they're, they're interchangeable. It's, it's interchangeable. Okay. Uh, it's it rises about a thousand feet above uh, a block plains that are broad plains that are around it. Basically, it's a mountainous area, but table kind of stands apart there um seasons probably around august it's uh it's uh, it's hot and jesus is 33 years old so that kind of sets the setting um now peter james and john are as i said the inner circle of jesus's best friends um the inner circle of the inner circle of the apostles um this is john the greater john the greater not john the lesser john the greater he was the bigger one uh and he was the first apostle who would suffer martyrdom right uh, this is John's. This is J James. This is James the Greater, John's brother. Right? Um, they're the three favored witnesses, it seems, of Jesus' major miracles. They're the ones that he takes when he raises uh, the little girl who, who's died. Uh, he takes them into the little girl's room, and remember, he says, uh, "I say to you, the little girl, uh, arise." Right? Um, so they're 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 special, and they also witness his greatest distress in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're the three that go. A little bit further into the garden with Jesus. Okay. Um, mystically, the saints say that these three denote um, uh, those who God prefers above others um, to, to behold the vision that He's about. They're about to see the transfiguration of Himself. Uh, why? Because um, Peter denotes uh, um, um, fervent, being fervent in charity or in love. Um, he's always quick to act. Right. And John's a virgin signifies virgins. Uh, of chastity, and James is the first martyr among the apostles, so um, he denotes martyrdom, and this is what the saints say, martyrdom and, and sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom. Um, the saints say, wouldst thou see God, be thou Peter, in other words, firm in virtue, be thou John in chastity, be thou James by mortifying thy vices. I was just kind of an aside. So. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, I was talking about Peter, James, and John. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> And I he hope was you guys got that because and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. Um, the transfiguration represents, in a way, and it should make us think of the the, the, the all the wonderful transfigurations of Christ, uh, the Word incarnate. Right? Um, Christ was, they say, transfigured four times in his incarnation, when the Word became flesh. Right? Um, and on the cross. Uh, in which he was so deformed by all of the, all the lashes and the scourging and the nails and the spitting that Isaiah in chapter 53 says, He hath no form, no comeliness, mm. and when we saw him, he had no beauty. He was transfigured on the cross as well in horror. Uh, he's transfigured in the resurrection when he's crowned with glory and honor from God, and in the Eucharist where he lies hidden under the species of bread and wine, um, and uh, it's almost as if he, he is transfigured into them in a way. So there's kind of four This missions, Jesus unveils his glory, later manifest in his resurrection, and shared by his angels and virgin mother in heaven. Mm -hmm. And he was transfigured, it says. Christ did not 
transfigure himself before these three apostles to manifest his divinity to them as he does the saints in heaven. We're talking about what Marianne just said. His divinity cannot be seen with the eyes of the flesh, right? What they see is uh, the brightness of his glory kind of uh, almost as a chink in, 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 the arm, in his armor kind of um, shining through, right? St. Augustine says... Like through a people? Like a people. That, right, that St. Augustine old. says that as the divinity shone outward through the flesh, so also the flesh being illuminated by the divinity was radiant through his garments, right? So his, his clothes become white as light as a result of the inner brilliance. Um, I mean, you can kind of think of it as a, a lamp and a lampshade, right? Kind of in that kind of a way. Hmm. Any thoughts? Marianne, you look like you're I'm just contemplating that because I thought more of like if there's a knot hole open in a fence. Sure, that, that works you too. Mm -hmm. see, you right. can see through, but you can't fully see. Right, they're not seeing his divinity, but they're seeing a sign of his divinity, right? The brilliance of his divinity, of his, of his glory, of his mm -hmm. true glory. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Moses is the legislator of the law, the old law. He's the one who received the law and, and gave it to the to Israel. Um, Elijah is the prince of the prophets. He's the great prophet, right? Um, and they show by their presence that the old order is not destroyed, but it's fulfilled. There's a continuation, a continuum, right? Mm -hmm. And hermeneutic, like Saint, like uh, Pope Benedict would talk about the, the Second Vatican Council, we need to understand it not in a hermeneutic or a way of understanding of rupture, but of, of continuation, right? Um, right, the, the the old law and the prophets being fulfilled in Christ. Right, right, and and um, particularly here with the passion prediction he just gave, um, the fact that they're appearing with him uh, are showing that that he is going to fulfill the law. That is continuation, even in the scandal of the cross. Right, even in the scandal of the cross, which is what they're talking about. Moses and Elijah, if uh, I believe it's in Luke, it specifically says they're talking about. Um, um, his passion, right? Um, the Old Testament was about Christ. Um, and without understanding the Old Testament, we really can't understand Christ. Um, Christ is the new Moses. He's the great prophet greater than Moses. Because this harkens back to when Moses, on the seventh day, went up with three companions on the mountain and was transfigured. Okay, I, I made that connection. Uh, the Old Testament background on this event is God's self-revelation to Moses on Mount Sinai. Both take place on the seventh day. Both occur on a mountain. Both Jesus and Moses take three companions with them. The faces of both Jesus and Moses shine with God's glory. Both involve the glory cloud of God's presence, and both events involve God speaking through a heavenly voice. So this is that's a type of what's of the of the transfiguration. Transfiguration on Mount Tabor or Horeb. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, Moses says this The Lord thy God will raise up to thee a prophet of thy nation, of thy brethren, like unto me. Him shall thou hear, right? Which is about what the Father is about to say, right? Um, okay. The Catechism uh, in, ch in paragraph 555 says, for a moment, Jesus dis discloses his divine glory. He also reveals that he will be the, he will have to go by the way of the cross at Jerusalem in order to enter into his glory. Right. Mm -hmm. It's important that this falls upon the passion prediction. Right. Moses and Elijah had seen God's glory on the mountain. Um, both of them had seen God's glory on a mountain. Um, the law and the prophets had announced the Messiah's sufferings. Um, Christ's passion is the will of the Father. The Son acts as God's servant. That's from the Catechism. Mm -hmm. The apostles will need to take strength from this in the days to come. And seeing his glory, knowing that he's going to die, kind of missing the point of the resurrection, they need to see this to give them an inner strength in the days that are to come. Right? Mm -hmm. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is well that we are here. If you wish, I will make three booths here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. So Peter assumes that Moses and Elijah have come to stay on a camping trip from heaven uh, in order to herald Jesus' glory, right? Uh, his coming into his kingdom. Um, he says, it is fortunate we are here. He means that being there, it's, it's good that they're there so that he and his companions can get to work making lodgings for them, three huts of branches, these booths, right? Um, simple Peter is being practical here, um, but he forgets that 
guests like these don't need lodging. They're spirits he's seeing after all, right? But Peter is just all enthralled and caught up in the whole business, and, and uh, you got to love Peter for that. Okay. While he was still speaking, uh, when while he, he was still speaking, when lo, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Just as Moses has said, you listen to him. You will listen to him. Sorry, I... I just wanted to point out that, that the whole booths thing mm -hmm. is not r just some random camping trip thing. It 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 is because of the festival of booths, the, the, which you can read about in Leviticus twenty three thirty nine through forty three. It's the liturgical feast that comes every year. At, um, uh, Peter desires to prolong the heavenly experience. The booths are small tent-like shelters erected yearly at the Jewish Feast of Booths. Right, okay. This liturgical feast became an early church symbol of the ongoing joys of heaven. You can find that in Revelation 7, 9 through 10. Okay, thank you. So, sorry. So here we have the Lord, the, the Father saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I want to please listen to him. This is... This is my beloved son. The cloud is the visible manifestation of God's presence, specifically of the Holy Spirit. Um, we need and to, the same words as at his baptism. Yeah, and well, I'll get to that in a minute. Sorry. Right. Now, when you think of the glory cloud that covered Sinai, or the cloud that covered Sinai, right, and the voice came out of the cloud, uh, and think of the cloud that, the glory cloud that filled the tabernacle, stood at the entrance to the tabernacle mm -hmm. from which God spoke to Moses. Uh, and think of the glory cloud, the Shekinah cloud that filled the temple in Jerusalem, right? This is, these are all manifestations, a visible manifestations of the presence of God. And right? it physically sat on the tabernacle. Uh, it sat on the mercy seat. Mercy seat, on which the, was on the, on the top of the ark. On the ark, right, yeah, which was sorry, in the tabernacle. In the tabernacle. Right? Um, so, like Marianne said, the voice repeats the words of Jesus' Jordan baptism by John, but with a warning that doesn't appear in the baptism, listen to him. Hmm. Now, why the warning, or it's really more of an exhortation. Listen to him, right? Uh, Catechism 517 says, Christ's whole earthly life, his words and deeds, his silences and sufferings, indeed his manner of being and speaking, is revelation of the Father. Hmm. Jesus can say, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And the Father can say, this is my Son, my Chosen, listen to him. Because our Lord became man in order to do his Father's will, the Father says, listen to him. Mm -hmm. Because even the, the least characteristics of his, of his mysteries manifest God's love. God's love, God among us. Right? And in this commentary, this is when it points out, it hearkening back to Deuteronomy 18, where Moses prophesies that, yeah, and yeah, listen to him. And listen right. to him. Um, so listen to him, uh, why? Because he makes, he reveals me to you. That's the answer, right? God the Father has spoken only one word. You should look for no other. And the voice is heard authentically only through the Catholic Church. Um, so that's why God is telling him, listen to him, because you're not going to get another voice. You're not going to get another revelation of me. This is it, right? This is the definitive revelation, the this only word it? I've spoken, right? Uh, and, and as Marianne noted, the, the, well, I think she noted, the whole Trinity is, makes an appearance here or is alluded to here, right? The voice of the Father, um, the glory cloud of the Spirit, uh, and of course uh, the Son, the son uh, in Jesus. Which happened at baptism. Right. And I think that's really the only time. What? That, that they all three appear like that. Is it baptism and It's the only time I can remember, but there may be others. Yeah. Um, now, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were filled with awe. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. What? I just had a thought of they were slain in the Spirit. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's a normal reaction to an encounter with God. Absolutely. In Genesis chapter 17, we, get, we see this from Abram, or mm -hmm. Abraham. And after he began to be ninety and nine years old, the Lord appeared to him and said unto him, I am the mighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. Abram fell flat on his face. Yeah, because you're, you're overwhelmed. I mean, I can't imagine 
doing anything else. In, in Ezekiel, we read this. In Ezekiel chapter 2, we read this. It happened in Ezekiel. This was the vision of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And I saw and I fell upon my face. And I heard the voice of the one that spoke. And he said to me, Son of man, stand up upon thy feet and I will speak to thee. Right? These are all, this is what's happening to the apostles, right? This is, this is another manifestation of God's presence. Not just in the glory cloud and in the voice and in Jesus standing there, but the reactions that they have, right, are pointing to this as a divine event. Daniel chapter 10, verse 8. When I heard, I lay in a consternation upon my face, and my face was close to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, and I, and I lifted me up upon my knees, and upon the joints of my hands. The, reading this, and you may not, you probably won't get this reference, but people watching might. Um, it it made me immediately in my head start singing the Mercy Me song. Um, I can only imagine. Um, you know, will I sing in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Or I, I mean, I'm sure I will be flat on my face. And lastly, I've heard Revelation. This is what happens to John. And when I had seen him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Right? First and the last. So these all are, uh, these all are closely related events in the Old mm -hmm. Testament and there in Revelation to what's happened to the apostles on Tabor. They've had an experience of God. Okay, so it's, I mean, it's just not, I, I bring that up just, well, you can write down the references there. Genesis 17, 1, Ezekiel 2, 1, Revelation 1, 17, and Daniel 10, 8. Why are you talking about that? Gen Genesis what? <laughs> Sorry, Genesis 17, 1. Uh-huh. Ezekiel 2, 1. Ezekiel 2, 1. Daniel 10, 8. Daniel 10, 8. Revelation 1, 17. 117? 117, right. Okay. okay. And it's continuing. And they were coming down the mountain. Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Mm. He replied, Elijah does come, and he is to restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Um, I was... Go ahead. Go ahead no, and start no, no. in case you were going to say what I was about to say. No, go I ahead. was going to talk a little bit about the end times and Elijah. but I'm, Well, I'm that's what I was going to... Well, no. Um, cause, because Elijah coming, the, prophe the prophecies were that Elijah would come... And restore all the tribes because there were there were tribes because of uh, the diaspora because of the exiles that they had no idea where any of those people had gone mm -hmm. at this point Judah. at this point yeah. no clue that started in Capernaum did you know that I learned that today yes um, so in so Capernaum is is like we've been talking about that's where Jesus has kind of been doing ministry when he started right when so the, Capernaum's up in the north and when the Assyrians first came or maybe it was the Babylonians uh, I think it was the Assyrians though when they when they sent off the northern tribes into exile it was from around there that they were sent out and right. lost basically but so so they they literally lost tribes of Israel so with uh, uh, with the the return of Elijah was supposed to be when the tribes would be reunited well we have they had no idea where those tribes were what jesus is talking about here is the new kingdom mm -hmm. within the church and that because it will include everyone it will truly unite all the tribes it's kind of like if you take an alka seltzer and you put it in a glass and it dissolves well you can't tell where the alka seltzer is but if you drink the whole glass, you've brought in all of the Alka-Seltzer. So you're including all of the tribes hmm. within the well, There's also a tradition kingdom. about a, a tradition of 
without a firm position from the church, as far as I know, about an Elijah, an actual another return of Elijah before the coming the of the second son coming. of the second coming. Right. Um, four things are supposed to happen before the second coming. The full number of Gentiles will have come into the church, um, and all Israel will recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Catechism 674, Romans 11:25. Um, some church fathers and commentators see a twofold coming of Elijah in Jesus' word. And among them would be Augustine, Christentum, John Christ, Saint John Chrysostom, and Saint Jerome. Coming. Oh, the full number shoot, of sorry. Gentiles will have come. Sorry, out. sorry, sorry, fat fingers. Um. Okay. Yeah, we're six seven of, four. We're off topic here a little bit, but uh, six seven four and. So there's this twofold coming: first, in the person of the Baptist before the advent of Jesus, and the second coming of Elijah to turn Israel to Christ before his final coming. Um, so p potentially a twofold coming of Elijah in some way. Um, and like I said, Augustine, Chrysostom, and Jerome said that. I don't think the church has a has a firm position on this matter, as far as I know. But anyway. Number two, the church must pass through a, a final trial and persecution that's going to shake the faith of many. Um, and many will apostatize and fall for a religious deception which offers uh, an apparent solution to our problems uh, at the price of that apostasy, right? Um, hmm. I didn't know you were going there. The okay. <laughs> of course, the supreme religious deception is the Antichrist, the pseudo mm -hmm. Messia, messianism by which man glorifies himself is what the catechism mm. puts it as uh, that's anything, 675 anything that is not of Christ is antichrist right so what does the disciples question about the coming of Elijah have to do with uh, all the things that are that were written and that were said in the previous verses um, the prophet Malachi said that Elijah would come before the great and terrible the glorious advent of the Savior uh, Malachi 4 Chapter, uh, five. chapter 4, 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. Um, the appearance and disappearance of Elijah on the mountain that they've just seen has troubled the apostles, apparently, right? Elijah's supposed to come, and now he's gone, right? He's just disappeared, and the Messiah's mission hasn't been furthered in any way. This seems to elicit mm. their question from him, yeah. right? Now, our Lord grants the expression of the scribes, or he grants the, uh, the scribes' teaching, right? Elijah is to come and restore, right? Bring back to perfection, right? Um, it's true. But he corrects its perspective. The herald, the Elijah who is to come, has already come in the person of the Baptist. That's the coming of Elijah. The great day of the Lord before which Elijah was to come is therefore the day of the Messianic visitation, his advent, right? Um, Jesus declares the sense of the prophecy, which is missed by the scribes, not literally Elijah, but in John, the spirit of Elijah and John the Baptist, right? Okay. All right, I know that was kind of an aside, hopefully not too confusing. Um, next, uh, we uh, are going to witness the miracle by Jesus healing uh, and exercising uh, an epileptic boy with a demon. Um, Jesus, Peter, James, and John come off the mountain to find three groups of people, the, apost the nine apostles who are with Jesus, some scribes, and a crowd with a man and his possessed son. So that's the scene. So they come down to the mountain. Uh, and they've 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 entered into a bit of a chaotic situation with all these people, you know, talking and running around and whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, "Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic." Some of your Bibles will say he is a lunatic. Okay. Mm -hmm. He is an epileptic and he suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. A word about lunatic. Because um, that will be in some of your, I don't know if it says lunatic there, it doesn't, no, it, it, says, it says epileptic, right. Um, why do they say lunatic in some of, in some of the translations? Um, because that's, the, the, they would, the, it's tied to the changes of the moon, luna, lunatic, right. Hmm. Um, ancient physicians sometimes thought that diseases that came and were gone, like epilepsy, which would happen for a time and then uh, not manifest again for another period of time, uh, were caused or influenced by celestial phases, right? So they would oh. call them a lunatic because the moon goes through phases, and they thought these things were tied to the phases of the moon. Interesting. Right? Anyway, just, just a little bit of an aside. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting. And the man continues, And it brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and perverse generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? 
bring him here to me. Oh, faceless, faithless and perverse generation, misguided generation, right? Um, Jesus is referring to everyone on the scene, not just his apostles, right? But probably especially to his apostles, but to everyone. It's, it's a lament, not a rebuke of his apostles, right? Mm -hmm. He's not saying you're faithless and worthless. He's, it's, a, it's a lament that they don't have the faith yet, that they, that they don't have enough faith, that they don't understand yet, right? I imagine he rolled his they eyes. and don't kinda, have the power yet. He kind of threw up his hands when he said this, you know. You know, they should know by now. Um, and Jesus rebuked him, the, Satan. And the demon came out of him, or the demon, I shouldn't say Satan, the demon. And the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Saying that to the apostles. Now, Jesus is a divine being. He knows what is possible. Everything's possible to him. It belongs to him by his divine nature to have such power, however, right? Which he's going... The fact that uh, Jesus answered to their question shows that Christians, by their union with him, and especially the apostles, can share in his power if they boldly trust, right? Uh, yeah. Sincere prayer is very powerful. Surrender to the Holy and Spirit. Jesus just told us so. Um, powerful, sincere faith, however, only comes with holiness and the closeness and the familiarity with God, mm -hmm. which uh, accompanies it, right? Um, in 1 John chapter 3, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, John says this, Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God, and whatever we ask, we receive of Him. Right? However, prayer is always to be made in deference to the will of God, right? Mm -hmm. To the divine will. Our Father knows best. I mean, we need to always bear that in mind, uh, unless uh, 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 because we, we there's a danger of becoming dejected because we don't have the power. Uh, or, right. or so we feel like second class Christians or unholy, right? Or our faith isn't great enough, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to remember, however, that faith working in love is the greatest faith, not faith that moves mountains, right? Not faith that right. moves mountains. Right. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. I, have, I may have utter faith so that I can move mountains. That's what Jesus just said, right? Yet if I lack charity or lack love, I count for nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Faith working in charity, faith working in love is the greatest faith, right? Not the faith to cast out a demon, right? Yeah, uh -huh. and and if what we're praying for is not good for us, God is not going to right. and do that either. Not just for us, but yeah, for, for, for whoever, right? People, yeah. Right. Um, and remember, we're living in a fallen state and, right. and suffering... Um, Suffering, death, disease, all this is a consequence of the original sin, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it is a fallen world. Jesus has redeemed it, and it's in the process of being redeemed. And all creation groans with uh, inexpressible groan, longing for uh, its transformation. Uh, St. Paul uh, tells the Romans, I believe, right? Um, but in the meantime, in a way, we need suffering because that's how we learn to love. Mm -hmm. Uh, we need someone suffering in our lives so that we can love, right? So that we can love. So a suffering person isn't necessarily a person who is to be just simply um, despaired of or a person who is simply to be pitied. They're a person who is doing the work of God by allowing others to love them, right? Mm -hmm. And that is a great gift. That is a great gift. So yeah, if, well, if God, we need to remember that, that when, when we need help, we need to be gracious enough to accept that help. Right. And if, allow others to grow by serving us. Right. If there was no Ooh, suffering, if there was no pain, there would be no mm, merit. That's, okay. that's we very... We wouldn't learn how to love. That can be hard to do, accepting okay. help. So we need to remember to accept help. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, writing in the 4th century, 386 AD is when he died, says this, Though one in name, faith has two dimensions. One is the faith by which our soul assents to dogmas and teachings and our will attests to specific truths. This is our, um, our subjecting our, our will and our intellect to the teachings uh, to, to God who has revealed himself. 
and which we we understand through the teachings of his church, mm -hmm. right? The other dimension of faith is that which was given by Christ to some as a free gift, a faith capable of performing works beyond any human power and of enduring great hardships. This is St. Cyril still. Strive to live the faith that depends on your effort, faith working in love, and lead to the Lord who grants that faith to you so that he may give you the other type of faith beyond any human strength or reckoning. Right? Faith working in love is the faith that we, uh, that is the greatest faith, right? That's the point here. Okay, continuing on. And as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. So they're, they're, they're probably gathering here, uh, getting ready to leave for Jerusalem for the last time. Since Peter's, um, since Peter's profession and Jesus' first passion prediction, the road is inevitably leading upward to Jerusalem, upward to Mount Calvary, right? And in Matthew, this is the second time this is the he's second. mentioned his right, 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 this right. Um, coming passion. From Mount Tabor, they've, they've walked about a full day's journey back to Capernaum, about 40 miles. So I mean, Jesus gets around quite a bit, as you can see. Um, and he got Marianne, his steps in. <laughs> yeah, as, as Marianne mentioned, this is the second passion prediction. The first one was in chapter 16. There's this one in chapter 17. And there's a final one in chapter 20, verse 18. And it says, and they were greatly distressed. Mm -hmm. uh, the titles Messiah, Son of God, Word to the Apostles, uh, something that were far removed from any thought of the rejection um, by the Sanhedrin and by the Jewish leaders of Jesus, right? And far from the prospect of his death, right? It's all been uh, um, lollipops and roses or whatever until now, right? <laughs> um, and although all three passion predictions are, are accompanied by a prophecy of his resurrection, the apostles seem to be a bit overwhelmed by the, the shocking prediction of, yeah. of the death that was going to come for Jesus, who is the Messiah, who is the Son of God. It's because just, they still don't understand that it's a three-day event. They're thinking right. in the end The, the times, nature of the resurrection is something resurrection. that's kind of vague and remote to them. I think we talked about this in a prior uh, mm -hmm. chapter. Um, Martha. That they're kind of thinking it the way Martha does, you know, the resurrection of the dead at the end, right? Um, so they're they're a little bit dazed and confused at this point. It doesn't I compute. Would you too. Doesn't compute, yeah. right? Okay, they're a little lost. Okay, uh, the temple tax. When they came to Capernaum, Capernaum, the collectors of the half shekel tax went up to Peter and said, "Does not your teacher pay the tax?" He said, yes. When he came home, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tribute? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me, and for yourself. Okay? This is Jesus catching a fish with a coin in its mouth. Mm -hmm. Peter's catching it. I mean, Peter catching the fish, sorry. Um, the epi this episode of the temple tax kind of has two messages. Uh, first, that Jesus is the Son of God, right? And he doesn't have to pay the temple tax because he's, guess what? He's Lord of the temple. He's actually the new temple, right? And second, that Peter is closely associated with him in governance of the church, right? And with the primacy of Peter here, he's the one that they approach. He's the acknowledged yeah. leader of the apostles, right? Yeah. They don't the, go the, to anybody else. The church else. officials go to, go to him. And it's intentional that, that Matthew mentions that, right? That he goes to Peter, right? He could have said to any, he goes to the disciples, why doesn't your master? But he said, no, he goes to Peter, right? Why does not your master, right? Now, this the shekel, this, this, this tax affected all male Jews at home and abroad at age 21 and over. Um, you can read about this in Exodus 30, verse 13. Exodus 30, verse 13. They would have to pay the half shekel. Anybody, any males over 21, whether they're in Jerusalem or not, right? Someone would come and collect the tax. It was paid every year, and it was used for the upkeep and the maintenance of the priests and the Levites who served in the temple for 
repairs in the temple for furnishing victims for sacrifices, that kind of thing. So the, the money sent to Jerusalem. So that's this that's the half shekel tax. Exodus thirty thirteen. Um, now the miraculous means by which uh, uh, the shekel tax is paid, in other words, a fish with a coin in its mouth, right, um, allows Jesus to avoid the scandal of not paying the tax. But at the same time, it really doesn't yield anything to the principle that the children are exempt, mm -hmm. right? Because the money does not come from the apostolic purse, right? Money doesn't come from the apostolic purse. Yeah, they're, they're, because of their sonship, they should be exempt from the taxes, but they want to avoid um, giving offense or causing scandal. Right, right. So that's how it's accomplished. Um, I found this really, interestingly enough, I, I this was interesting enough to me that I highlighted in here talking about you will find a shekel because the shekel was literally the full payment for Jesus and for Peter. Mm -hmm. And in here it says the single payment for both Christ and Peter underscores the spiritual union between Jesus and his vicar on earth. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. There's Peter's closely associated with Christ in this episode. And in all, basically all the episodes, we see Peter's in some way, form, or fashion, typically anyway, especially when it's a, profound miracle or in a suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, because it's a divine sonship shared by Jesus naturally and Peter adoptively. There you go. Okay. Yeah. That brings us to the end of the chapter. Kind of a short chapter. Yeah, but there's so much in it yeah. to think about. Does anybody have any questions? Did we... Folks never have did questions. We, well, I, I don't know. We might have confused I'm, I'm, people. That's what sometimes I'm thinking. You, I just confuse Sometimes people. you confuse me when you start Going off using tangent. well, no, you start using the old English. Oh, when, when you I'm read, quoting scripture, yes, yeah. and uh, uh, my citations here in my notes are uh, all of them come from the Dewey Reams, which I, I like, but it's not the best translation. It, but I, do like I it. appreciate that. The, the the it is it is beautiful language, but sometimes I don't follow you when we're trying to do it in Bible study. It gotcha. confuses me. Okay. But other words, yeah, I'm, I'm I am using... a bear of little brain. Right. Well, no, you're think, not. Think, think. I'm, 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 the translation I typically use is the revised um, RSV, the revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, Second Catholic Edition, I think. Um, don't use the new revised Standard Version. Use the revised Standard Version. The new revised Standard Version uses inclusive language, I think. So I avoid that one. Um, but it's a very good. It's a very good translation. Uh, we use the NAB, the New American Bible, and the Liturgy. Which isn't bad. Uh, I just prefer the, the Revised Standard Version. I think that it's a little bit more beautiful language, a little more expressive, I think. Yeah. But that's a personal preference. So it's actually it's a good thing to have two or three translations. Like I've the RSV, I have the NAB. Uh, I think I have a Knox. Um, we don't have a Jerusalem Bible. I don't think maybe we do. Uh, and then the I don't Reams, think we do. And the Dewey Reams version, right? So actually, I even have my computer, the King James. Thank you, Carmen. Your mom says a good presentation. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, tomorrow is October. Can you believe it? St. Therese. Yep. The Feast of St. Teresa of Jesus or St. Teresa of Avila. Therese of Lisieux. She's a she's an interesting cat or saint, she I should say. She is. About you said somewhere. Avila. No, she's the 15th. Therese of Lisieux is tomorrow. The little flower is tomorrow. Oh, I thought it was because on October first, if you have a, You're if right. you know of a young woman that you think would make a good religious sister, it's a great idea to give her a rose right. and tell her that you think that she would make a good religious sister. It doesn't have to be a live rose; it can be a virtual rose on their Facebook or Instagram, and say, "Hey." Have you ever thought about being a religious sister? Because I think you'd make a great one. Roses from St. Therese. Yes, uh, October 15th, which I believe is one of the uh, debate days, is St. Teresa of Avila. Um, and yesterday, yep, St. Michael was a, uh, was a debate day. And um, Thank you, there's you another debate well. day that some really fantastic saint that I can't remember right now but uh, yeah pray for our country pray for each other um, speaking of prayer 
we should close out our evening with yep. prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, um, which presents us with the life, the words, and the deeds of your Son, who reveals uh, you to us. Um, we thank you for the gift of the Spirit, of your church, of the liturgy, which does the same. Bless us this evening and help us to get a restful night's sleep and safety uh, yes. and guard our going and our coming tomorrow and bless the work of our hands. And uh, we ask uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary, our mother, um, to intercede for us and to be our spiritual guides as we pray. Hail Mary, Hail Mary full, full of grace, grace the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, women and, blessed and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Amen. St. Jerome, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I completely forgot. Today is his feast day, and he had a large part to do with that old duet reams you like so much. Yeah, he did. He was one of, <laughs> that's, that's where we get the Vulgate um, from I know. his translation. But, right? yes. The Latin Vulgate, which is Saint where the duet reams comes from. Very important person when it comes to the Holy Bible. So. Mm -hmm. God bless you all. We'll see you next Wednesday at 8 o'clock for Chapter 18. And I'll be here at 3 o'clock tomorrow to pray the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Please join us for all of the above. God bless you. Have a great evening.